So thank you, Jorge, while we're waiting for the show to come up. It's really great to be here. I actually grew up in Van Nuys and, uh, as he said, went to Caltech. So I, I'm pretty familiar with Southern California water issues. I uh, live in Arizona right now where water is an even more pressing concern. And I wanted to talk to you uh, this afternoon about our water situation, about the need for a, a new water ethic, and about what we can all do as citizens, as public officials, as consultants to make changes. But to kind of set the tone, what I wanted to do first is to read you a short poem by a mid 20th century resource economist named Kenneth Boulding. And Kenneth Boulding was a really unusual guy. He used to express most of his scientific observations in poetry and was the only man ever to be president of the American Economics Association for Academics and the American Psychological Association. So you could say in a way he was one of the first people that understood behavioral economics the way we do today. So Mr. Boulding writes about water. Water is far from a simple commodity. Water is a sociological oddity. Water is a pasture for science to forage in. Water is a mark of our dubious origin. Water is a link with a distant futurity. Water is a symbol of ritual purity. Water is politics. Water is religion. Water is just about anyone's pigeon. Water is frightening. Water is endearing. Water is a lot more than mere engineering. Water is tragical. Water is comical. Water is far from pure economical. So discussions of water, though free from aridity, are apt to produce a good deal of turbidity. So my goal today is to help clarify some of the turbidity of our thinking around water and then to sort of indicate you know, where we can go from here. Now, because this is right after lunch, I want to give you the takeaways at the beginning. So if you really feel the need for a snooze, you'll at least have gotten something out of the presentation. And as I told people this morning, my real goal today is to see more eyeballs than eyelids. So I hope you'll help me out with that. First key takeaway, water is the next big green thing. We really do know how to get energy use in our buildings down to net zero. We know how to do that. We know almost how to do it already on a conventional budget. But water is the next thing we have to tackle in the green building movement. There's a lot of international experience and technology that we can adapt for our use. So we don't have to experience what I call the NIH syndrome, which is not National Institutes of Health. It's not invented here. We can take stuff from all over the world to help with our water issues. And finally, there's a lot of great opportunities here, not just for the public sector, but for businesses, contractors, designers, facility managers, business owners, lots of opportunity going forward. Why talk about water efficiency? Um, and, and since I've long since, I'm half Irish, so I've long since perfected the art of shameless self-promotion. So this is the book that you can all buy, and I think we're selling it at a discounted $20 out in the lobby. Um, but water is the oil of the 21st century. And since my original training was in the water field, when I decided to write a, sort of a, the next green building book, I decided water should be the subject because we really haven't thought about it systematically in the green building movement. It's really the oil of the 21st century. I'll explain all these points in a second. Our fresh water supplies are inherently limited. Population urban growth are creating large water footprints all over the world. Global climate change is having a huge impact on water supplies. We're looking at major droughts ahead for not just California and the Southwest, but the entire southern tier of the U.S. And water conservation, in case you need to be remembered, is the law in California. The California cities by 2020 are supposed to save 20% of the water they use per capita in 2008. Look at water use over time, the last 50 years. You could see agriculture dominates. Now, there's a lot of water out there, but we do need food, we do need fiber, we do need all the things that agriculture produces. So you can't just say we're gonna take it from agriculture and give it to cities. It doesn't work like that. And particularly in California, 
where agriculture tends to be the swing vote in state elections. Agriculture has a lot of power and a lot of power in the U.S. as a whole. But what I mean about the oil of the 21st century, it's going to be the source of conflicts in much the same way that oil was a source of conflicts in the 20th century. If you look at a map of the United States and, and most maps of the world, what you're going to see is the boundaries between states and countries are these little squiggly lines we call rivers. And if there's two countries or two states on either side of a river and maybe even more states upstream in the headwaters, you have a recipe for conflict. In addition, all of our existing water sources are fully allocated. There is no more to allocate. We've settled the West long ago, and we've allocated all the water. So we've got to think about how we're going to reallocate it, given the fact that 100 years ago, most people lived on farms or in farm communities. And today, 75% of Americans live in cities. Worldwide, 50% of people now live in cities. So all of a sudden, we've got to rethink this whole thing around water. And so it really is the next battleground between urban and rural interests uh, in the U.S. and in the world. It's funny to be talking about water because we're surrounded by it. You know, we live right next to the ocean. The problem is the fresh water supply that we're readily available for drinking is not very abundant. In fact, I like to say we've made no new water since Adam and Eve. If you think about it, that's true. And the usable fresh water is a tiny fraction of the total. In much of the world, it's too polluted to drink. And throughout the world, including the US, we've been depleting groundwater resources, both renewable groundwater resources and fossil resources, to support agriculture, something that will come to an end sometime in the next 50 years. Here you can see the fresh water supply is very limited. Fresh water is about 3% of the total of water on Earth. Of that, two-thirds is locked up in glaciers and ice caps, leaving about 1% of the water on Earth as fresh water. And almost all of that is below the ground, which takes energy to get out. And of the water that's above the ground, most of it's in the Great Lakes in the United States. That's where our fresh water supply is. Well, last time I looked, Michigan and, and Wisconsin and Illinois weren't willing to send their water to California. So we have to deal with the water that we've been given. This, by the way, for our thinking, is very, very different than the energy situation. We can ship energy all over the world, right? In the form of gas and oil, nuclear fuel. We can't do that with water. So we have to think about it very differently. There's also this notion of the water footprint. Now, we think about the water we drink, the water we use to irrigate our lawns, etc. But if you really think about it, there's a water footprint in everything we do, in all of our building products. And so I chose an example here that most people can relate to, a liter of beer, a mug of beer. If it comes from the Czech Republic, there's about 45 liters of water used to grow the crops, process them, make the beer. If it comes from South Africa, Republic of South Africa, it's about 150 liters. Why do you think that is? One group of crops needs a lot more irrigation than the other. And so the water footprint is starting to be something that corporations are looking at, that all kinds of organizations are having to respond to. Now, then we talk about global climate change. You know, most of us don't think about water very much, except we know sometimes in summer there's less water available. Most of our water around the world comes from snow melt in summer, right? If we're still trying to take it out of surface water resources. And when we have changes in climate that we're experiencing now, you get a smaller snowpack, meaning more of the winter precipitation tends to fall as rain rather than snow. What does fall at snow melts quicker because it's a bit warmer. You get larger spring runoffs, greater flooding, reduced summer stream flows, higher evapotranspiration, a loss of water to the atmosphere, less soil moisture, and more irrigation required. So you sort of have to follow this chain of events. And so what it means is that in order to get water conservation, we're going to have to change how we price it. We're going to have to change how we think about it. I came across this little uh, excerpt from the University of California, Berkeley Center for Hydrologic Modeling. And I, I like the first quote. The director says, 
When it comes to the future of water, we are on many levels completely and totally hosed. And most people understand the slang, if not the pun. So what's happening is the water cycle itself is changing. And all of these things, not only are warmer temperatures causing changes, but they also mean there's more evaporation of water to the atmosphere. More water in the atmosphere means greater flooding incidents with heavy rainfalls and extreme droughts. So if you actually study water over time, you realize water is not, water events are not normally distributed, a bell curve. Water events happen in extremes. And so he says, we can expect extreme extremes. And one good example of this, when I, when I wrote the book, I, I took a look at Los Angeles rainfall statistics, 1999 to 2008. They ranged from 3.2 inches in one year to 38 inches in another year. Think about that, a factor of 12 between the lowest and the highest. So you could easily be in a drought for five or six years in California. We had that from 87 to 92. We had extreme drought conditions in California. So this is a recurring phenomenon throughout the Southwest. I mean, we only average 16 inches a year of rain. I live in Tucson now, we get 12 inches a year of rain. That's not much to run an urban civilization on and to think about sustainability with. In addition, water and energy are like Siamese twins. They are joined at the hip. It takes energy to make water and water to make energy. We need water to cool thermal power plants, which is most of our electricity supply, right? And we need energy to move and treat water. In fact, in California, the Energy Commission says almost 20% of our, all of our electricity use is just for moving and treating water. A third of natural gas use roughly in California is for heating water. So if you're gonna talk about energy, you have to talk about water and vice versa. Sandia National Lab says, by the mid 2020s, barely 15 years from now, based on current technologies and current approaches, there won't be enough water for our energy needs and enough energy for our water needs. So we have to start thinking much more holistically. We can't have an energy commission over here and a Department of Water Resources over here and not ever link them together. We can't have a water agency here, a sewage agency here, a flood control agency here, and never think about the whole cycle. But we do, because it was simple in the old days to keep everything separate. And I also want to make a point that conservation and efficiency aren't the same things. Conservation, in a way, means less total use and certainly less total use per capita. Efficiency, however, doesn't guarantee conservation. Just as an example, Many people here probably travel, you use the toilet uh, in the restrooms at the airport. Every time you lean forward, it flushes, right? They used to have a handle on those things. One use, one flush. Now you can have two or three or even four flushes per use. So you have a device that's supposed to guarantee efficiency which leads to less conservation. So this isn't just about devices. And I, I showed you here a picture of an example of a some thinking about uh, water conservation and efficiency. This is from one of the large plumbing manufacturers. And some engineer had a brilliant idea. Well, let's just have people wash their hands over the toilet and just have the water flow into the bowl. So we'll get two uses out of the same amount of water, right? How many people really want to straddle the toilet <laughs> to wash their hands after using the toilet? The answer is not very many. This is no longer on the market. They've come up with some other ways to do it. But it deals with the issue of behavior. Many people have seen the green handle in the restrooms of various public facilities. You, you push down, you get a full flush. You pull up, you get a partial flush, right? That's the idea. And they even have signs that tell you that. And there's even three drops of water where the heavy flush is and one drop is. The problem is, how many people want to touch the handle in a public restroom? And I can just imagine, now think of this for a minute. You, you really want to do the right thing. So you brace yourself against the sides of the toilet and with your other foot you lift up the handle. How many people are willing to do that? 
Yeah, for the exercise. Yeah, there's a gentleman there. Talk to him afterwards. He may need some professional guidance. Uh, <laughs> we also have the law of unintended consequences. San Francisco uh, last summer bought $14 million worth of bleach to put down their sewers because their water conservation program was so effective that the sewers, which have been designed in an era of five gallon per flush toilets and five gallon per minute shower heads, weren't getting enough water to flush themselves. So we could put in all these toilet retrofits and all the shower head retrofits and all the sink aerators, and then we have to open up the fire hydrants in August and flush all the sewers to move the stuff downstream. So we have to think about systems as systems. And one of my favorite sayings is, you cannot replace a system with anything but another system. We have a system in place for water use, water supply, wastewater treatment that doesn't work in the new era. And so I think it's going to be quite some time before we can replace the whole system. We have centralized sewage treatment, centralized water supply. We need in many ways to move to decentralized distributed systems. One of the benefits of water conservation is it gives you a virtual reservoir to work with. You know, California in 2009 passed the first significant water legislation in almost 50 years because of the drought. As Rahm Emanuel famously said, President Obama's first chief of staff, never let a good crisis go to waste. So the California legislature, uh, perpetually in crisis, decided not to let this one go to waste. And part of the bill was we we're going to build new reservoirs in the southern Sierra Nevada. How many people think that will ever happen? The answer is, it'll never happen. We have to build these virtual reservoirs of conservation in our cities to take the water peak and reduce it. Now let's talk about droughts. Since 2006, we've had major droughts in a lot of places in the U.S., not just California. Texas has been in huge drought. Many people read about last summer's drought in Texas. In, in 2009, San Antonio, the, I believe the fifth largest city in the country, went nine months without seeing a drop of water from rainfall. So they had to draw down the aqu Edwards Aquifer under the city to significant levels. They were in real crisis. Atlanta in 2007 was within 30 days of running out of water. Imagine being in a metro area of four million people running out of water. You don't want to go there. It's what we call, that generates what we call the pucker factor among public officials. In Australia, they endured five years of drought from 2005 to 2010. The Murray, Dar Murray Darling Basin, which is the largest river in southeastern and eastern Australia, started to look like the bathtub rings that we see now in Lake Mead. You know, Lake Mead is now down below 1950 levels of water. And you got all of Las Vegas depending on it. So Australia is a country of 20 plus million people. Just about everybody lives near the coast. Um, in, except for the tropics in the north, it's quite dry. In fact, it's often called the driest continent on Earth. And what happened is global climate change actually moved all the storm tracks south towards Antarctica. And so for five years, they endured the biggest drought in their recorded history. What did they do? They had a coordinated response by national and state governments. It's easier in Australia. You only have eight state governments to deal with. And you have a parliamentary system where you don't have a separate executive and legislative function, so you can actually do things. Uh, $13 billion plan. That's not a lot of money for 20 million people. Uh, water restrictions were in all the urban areas. I happened to be in Sydney and Melbourne in 2007 and 2009. And you could not water your garden but twice a week. You got real used to carrying water from the bathtub out to the garden, right? Uh, but it generated a lot of product innovations. They had what's called a water efficiency labeling scheme, much like our EPA water sense, and they made it mandatory. Every product had to be labeled. And so you got tremendous innovations. And in fact, if you think about it and study a bit of the history, both the dual flush toilet and the water-free urinal came from Australia to the U.S. So water shortages do generate uh, product innovations. What was also interesting to me was to find that the unionized plumbing industry was front and center in solutions. 
They created a green plumber training program, which we actually imported to the U.S. We've trained about 5,000 green plumbers in the U.S. over the last five years. Large water utilities are actually recycling water to homes, wastewater. So instead of just using it for golf courses and, and highway medians and street medians, the wastewater is going right back to the homes to flush toilets. So instead of worrying about toilet to tap, that old problem for water supply managers, we actually now have toilet to toilet, which is a great concept. You just have to plumb the home differently at the beginning. And the public's cooperating. Desalination was adopted as a fallback option. And I know no one in California likes to talk about desalination, even though we have 1,000 miles of coastline. But ultimately, that's the resource. It's not the first resource. It's not by any means the cheapest. It's not without environmental consequences. But nothing we do is without environmental consequences. So we, we have to sort of get past that. Something else that's coming from Australia is a new practice called sewer mining. Now, I was trained as a civil engineer. All I remember now, of course, is water flows downhill. But, <laughs> but if you think about it, sewage is 98% water. All we have to deal with is that other 2%. So Australia says, geez, we're in cities. We've got sewage running down the middle of the street. Why don't we tap it and mine it, bring it into our buildings, treat it? Is that any different than treating the, the water that flows from the toilets in the same building? No. So what they're doing is they're using it for toilet flushing and cooling tower makeup. And cooling towers in warm climates are huge consumers of water. It's hidden, but it's there. So this is a way to cut water use dramatically in cities with waters that's, uh, water that's already there. And in fact, we have a project like that um, being built right now in Seattle. So uh, it'll, it'll come to the US. So what are the lessons learned? In a crisis, everything's on the table. It's easier to do big things politically in their system because they don't fight with each other the way we do. The system favors big, long-term solutions. Now, if you're a water supply planner or you have any involvement with the water supply industry at all, you know that these solutions are multi-decades in the making. You can change energy fairly quickly, changing water Institutional arrangements, water systems, it's a lot harder. Public participation is vital. Without the public buy-in, you can't really do much. You can mandate new technology in a crisis. And so that's another opportunity to look at because California will have another drought. It's time now to start thinking about what could we mandate at that time and that you can try and evaluate exotic solutions like desalination I had a, a state legislator from uh, Victoria State, where Melbourne is, talk to me about this. I said, you know, desalination is a pretty expensive solution. In fact, Sydney built a $1.7 billion desal plant, which they then mothballed as soon as the crisis passed, because it's too expensive to operate. But it's there. And this guy said to me, he said, you know, I go out and recruit companies to locate in my state all the time. If I can't guarantee them a water supply, they're not going to come. That's what it's for. And so we do have to think about how are we going to guarantee water supply for industry and as well as agriculture at times of crisis. And so what's driving this in the US? Well, clearly, we have water shortages. We have droughts. Uh, I live in Tucson. In my development of 110 homes, you, you, it's against the rules to have a front yard lawn. You can't do it. You need desert landscaping. Everything has to be drip irrigation. If you build a new apartment building, you cannot have a lawn. And all new homes in Tucson need gray water sub outs. It's very cheap. You do it with the rough plumbing. All it means is if I want to use gray water from the sinks, the showers, the bathtub, I don't get it mixed with sewage before I can get to it because that's our current slab on grade system. If you want to jackhammer the slab on your home to put in a gray water system, you're welcome to it. I have one, but I can only use the laundry water. So we need to think about what's worth doing in the financial and regulatory area. Every time we have toilet giveaways, they're oversubscribed in weeks in most water agencies. Green certification programs such as LEED really do help because in LEED now, 
you've got to have 20% water savings to even qualify for certification. So that's a, that's a real start. And you can't get any points till you hit 30%. So all of a sudden, LEED is really driving this in new buildings as well as in the existing building market. We've got rising costs. If water and energy are joined at the hip, as energy costs go up, water costs go up, guaranteed. And finally, there's a big stakeholder concern. And I'd like to suggest to you that one of the big stakeholder concerns, we're sort of in the shadow of Earth Day right now, is treating water as a special gift, not looking at it just as another input to production. We need to become water stewards in a way that we haven't really done in this country. Water's just been there for the taking. Now we have to create, in the era of sustainability, a new water ethic. And that's the stakeholder concern that's still a bit below the surface, but if I could use the metaphor, is beginning to bubble up. There's also inhibiting forces. Water is still cheap, bottom line. Water is still cheap, although bottled water is more expensive than gasoline on a per unit basis, uh, water itself is still pretty cheap, and particularly in building operations. We still prefer high water use lifestyles like the green lawn, and I, a gentleman handed me a pamphlet out there, I'm sure he's exhibiting here somewhere, about a new kind of grass that will use less water. I said, I'm all for that. But the bottom line is, this is cultural. This is not something that we require for living. We have the law of unintended consequences, I mentioned. You can't just change a piece of a system. We have codes that take time to change, and we're not thinking holistically about water, and that needs to change. Instead, we have what I call the hydrological cycle of, of water concern. Uh, when it rains, nobody is particularly concerned. We have the apathy. You know, I, growing up in Southern California, I really loved rain because you could see all the lawn sprinklers running at the same time. <laughs> on all the commercial properties, right? And somebody told me once that the uh, uh, sprinkler controllers that are out there, almost all of them are at factory presets. Nobody has ever redone them. But we have apathy, then we get into a drought, then there's public awareness concern, and then finally panic. Then it rains again, which it always will at some point in a drought cycle, and then we have public apathy. So we have to kind of get built, built beyond the hydrological cycle. So what should the public sector do? When I was doing research for the book, I found there were four main things that needed to be done. First, public education. There's great public education on water conservation out there. You just have to do it. We need regulation. We need to figure out how to get lower water uses built into the environment. We need incentives. People respond to incentives, even small incentives. And finally, we need to price things differently. And, and, and then behind all of this is a conservation ethic. We have very strong environmental awareness in California, obviously in Southern California. It isn't too much to say, let's make this into an ethical principle. We need to price things right, incentivize retrofits. You can read the rest. And doing these things, which None of them together are very costly, and in fact, most of them are free. We can achieve 20 by 2020. Here's an example of pricing, just to just sort of make it real. And by the way, the first real experiment in, in water pricing to reduce use was actually in Orange County in the early 90s. Irvine Ranch Water District ran that experiment, and it worked. You cut use when you raise prices. That is not an unusual concept. People respond to cost. And so Las Vegas now, it costs you nine times as much at the top tier as at the first tier for your water use. Here's an example with eight times pricing. And so what happens is you need to do this carefully because the first thing you do when you get conservation is the water agency gets less money. And then everybody gets upset and they want to cut all the programs. So you need to figure out how to price things so that you get less water use but no diminishment of agency revenues. Then you make everybody happy. And you can also give a cheap first tier of water so you handle the social equity issue as well. And where does it leave business? A dynamic future. I'm going to speak to a water technology investment conference in San Francisco next month. This is a huge area for investment. New technology systems, approaches, new products and markets. 
and larger issues of supply security and cost. This is a very dynamic environment for the private sector as well. And so what's the bottom line? What are green and water sense buildings going to look like in 2015? You're going to see a lot of buildings with net zero water use on an annual basis. They're going to live off the rainfall that falls on the site. You're going to see a lot more on-site treatment and reuse. You're going to see a lot more domestic uses of recycled water. In Singapore, they're actually taking treated sewage, well-treated sewage, and putting it directly into water supply reservoirs. And Singapore is a country of 5 million people, which depends on Malaysia for 40% of their water. That contract expires in roughly 30 years. Singaporeans are a bit worried. Malaysia doesn't have to give them any water after 2030 or 2040. So they're doing it, they're calling it new water, which is a great marketing thing. So uh, we need new water for many sources, far more efficient systems, and we need a whole new class of designers called whole systems engineers. That, if you're a young person in the audience, if you have kids going to school, tell them to start thinking as whole systems engineers. So I like to say the future is green and blue, but if you want to score, you have to run to where the ball's headed. Ask yourself, if you're in business, if you're in government, what will the built environment look like in 2020? What will be the next normal as far as water is concerned? How can we get there? And will non-green and non-blue buildings and homes pay a market penalty? I really believe that this is the decade in which water awareness is in fact going to bubble up to the surface and that we have a tremendous opportunity here to show leadership in Southern California that will bring business, environmental, and economic benefits to our communities. And as somebody said 150 years ago, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. And I think the time has come for a new water ethic, for water stewardship, and water sustainability. Thank you very much. The new IACO Green Code will address many of the things that you brought up. One of the major ones will be the circulation of hot water so that you don't turn on the faucet and have it run down the sewer while you're waiting for hot water. Uh, this alone will save 10,000 gallons per house uh, with a properly designed uh, circulation system. So this new green code will have many uh, very restrictive uh, aspects on new plumbing design. Yeah, that, that's a great, a great comment. Um, recirculating hot water systems on timers is really wonderful. In fact, it's my wife's number one issue. Why are we wasting water waiting for the hot water to come through the pipes? And so I put in a recirculating pump with a timer on it from 5 to 8 in the morning, 6 to 8 in the evening. You get hot water instantly. So yeah, that's easy to do. So thank you for that comment. Going back to your graph about you know, agricultural use versus, you know, industrial versus home use, you know, city use. And I know you said about agriculture and, and its conundrum, but, you know, when, the, when we do come into drought conditions and some of the agriculture is being used for things like growing cotton in the, in the Imperial Valley, you know, how do we address that? I mean, sure, we need food, but, you know, how do we really get to that? Sufficiency and sustainability. Yeah, so there's certainly a, a great question about whether crops that originated in the southeast, in the wet southeast, like uh, in, in, where I live, they grow pecans um, and cotton, um, and, you know, whether we should be growing those crops at all. And, and my solution is not to argue with every farmer about what crops they, they plant, is, is to continually force innovation on the farming sector in terms of uh, reduced water use per unit of crop. Raising prices does the number one trick. And so the big issue in California is that so much of agriculture is supplied by federal projects and not state projects. So you, you know, you've got to really look holistically at, at pricing, technology, all the things that go into agriculture. 
But I, I don't think it's possible to sort of pick out one crop or one, one region. Yeah, they're only doing it because it's cheap. When it stops being cheap, that stuff goes out of production. Pretty simple. So part of the question is, you know, ethically, we have a lot more agriculture in the U.S. than we need for ourselves, but we also have a responsibility to help feed people around the world, I think, ethically. So th there's a lot more going on here, and so that's why I think this is, it takes a holistic look, it takes a multi-decade approach, and as you might guess, this is something that we need to work on because water law is still 19th century, and water requirements in California 21st century we have to reform the laws that were basically said, hey, if you settle the West, take whatever water you want. And we're still living with those laws. So there's a lot going on here that takes more than just a drought to solve. It has to be a resolve that we're going to go in a different direction. And that's a community consensus that we need to build, in my view, that's not here yet. Question? I actually don't know, uh, but I know that environmental education in general has been a huge issue over the last 40 years. And so my guess is that people are addressing water issues. Certainly everybody studies the hydrological cycle in the fifth grade or something like that. So what it is is, is I think there's a larger issue here, which is we're not really connected with our water resources. And so I really think that the first step is to reestablish that connection. I know you're doing stuff with the Los Angeles River, which used to be an ephemeral stream, and maybe flowed once long ago. Um, we, need, we need to get that connection back before we can really motivate people to make these other changes. So I would say the first thing to do, if I had kids, take them out to some place where there's actually flowing water. I grew up in Los Angeles, and uh, I went to Caltech as an undergrad, studied water engineering. Nobody ever mentioned there were actually things living in those streams that we were engineering. It was this deficiency of my education that took a few years to get past. But take people out to where there's actually water flowing. You don't have to go too far and, and, and show them what it's like. You know, that to me is the, you have to make a visceral connection. This is a core element of our being, right? We're 90% or whatever percent water. So somehow, as Robinson Jeffers, a poet, once said, the tides are in our veins. So we need to get that connection back, that emotional, visceral connection. I lived in Portland for 15 years. If you want to talk about environment and water, you just talk about the Pacific salmon. In the Northwest, that's the totem animal. People get emotional when they talk about salmon. And because of that, all the rivers on the coast are still protected. That are the salmon rivers, and they're starting to take dumb dams back out of the Columbia and the Snake Rivers. So we need to figure out how we're going to get this connection in a much more emotional way to make it work politically. Because politics only works on things that people really care about. For the most part, it doesn't work. So I would say probably the most valuable person may not be the water engineer, but the poet and novelist. Who's going to write the first great novel about drought in Southern California? And maybe it's already been written. Everyone saw Chinatown, the movie. You got what was going on, right? So this is a fertile field for all of you uh, non-technical types. One more? One more question, please. I'm half Irish, so I'll talk all afternoon. but. Without beer. I have two in my house. What is there to speak to? You just, yeah, you got a big button for a big flush and a little button for a little flush. Even somebody with a room temperature IQ can figure that out. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, there is such a thing as norms. And in Australia, where they invented the dual flush toilet, it's not that hard, you know. I, I think if you don't like waterless urinals or water-free urinals, there's a one pint per flush option. It gets 87% of the savings anyway. So, uh, I, but I have two in my house, so I don't know what the issue is. It's simply they cost a little more, and you have to figure out occasionally the, the handle gets a little bit uh, out of its kilter, and you gotta lift up the lid and redo things. It's not that complicated. Um, so I just think it's, it is about education. If you're gonna do uh, toilet change outs, change them out with dual flush. That's something an agency could do quite easily. Is it, where are we on time? Are we okay? Is there one more, another question? Three more questions. Yeah. I don't have any of these engineers speaking, I don't think. Oh, there he is. This is an engineer right there. You gotta stand up so people can see what an engineer looks like. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, LEED in 2009 took the direction of being very focused on energy. And it actually reduced the focus on the things that affect people the most, which is materials and indoor environmental quality. So LEED 2012, I don't know, has something like 20 or 30,000 comments on it now. I'm sure a few of those are about the water efficiency. But I would say that you, know, you can't just look to LEED as, as a way to make this happen. We know enough to re-engineer and redesign these systems. We just have to set the goals. If you set a goal of 50% less water use in every new building project and 35 to 40% less use in every existing building renovation, you'll quickly start to push the envelope of all these technologies. So I really think LEED in a way is catching up to where practice is going. And I think practice needs to go further in the water saving area. And if you sit in most design meetings, and I've sit in a few, and many of you do as well, water is never really coming up as a huge issue. But it's time for that to happen. And so each of us can take at least that much and say, okay, I got 15 lead points in the bag, I got 20 lead points in the bag on water to bring to the table, and then figure out how to do it.